should be going. All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Science of Prairie Chicken. So uh, today we're going to be talking about these really cool grassland birds. Um, this might be one of the first times that I've done a game species uh, when we're talking about um, animals or on our science of. So it's a little bit different today, but they have a very uh, key component in our grasslands and our prairies. So we're going to be talking about these really neat birds today. Um, so I will go ahead and share uh, my screen for all of you. We're going to be talking, like I mentioned, about prairie chickens. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. All right. Sorry, everyone. My PowerPoint says it needs to verify itself. It's funny, but we'll get there eventually. So um, like I mentioned, um, if you have any questions throughout, please put them on. If I cannot answer them, I will find someone hopefully that can answer them um, and we will uh, figure out a way to get that answer to you. So, all right. For those of you, like I mentioned, that have never joined a science of before, uh, we are going to be talking about prairie chickens. And this is one of the key species that we have in Nebraska. Um, sorry, so many buttons. Okay, there you go. All right, we'll get there. All right, so here we go, prairie chickens. So let's go ahead and talk about prairie chickens. Um, if you've never joined us before, if you have questions, I ask, encourage you to ask questions and comments, but please just make sure that they are relevant and on topic to what we're talking about. Otherwise, Paige does have the right to remove you. Um, so just go ahead and um, be nice to everybody and keep the topic um, on point and we won't have problems. I also just wanna tell people that I am by no means an expert in any of the science of programs that I've talked about. Um, someday I would like to be an expert in maybe like one thing or be considered an expert. Um, I do a ton of research and I, like I mentioned, I don't know everything and I'll readily admit I don't know everything. Um, I don't even come close. So if you have questions and I can't answer them, I will find someone that can answer those for you and get back to you on that. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about these really cool birds. If you don't know what a prairie chicken is, here's your first um, introduction to them. So it's a fun picture. Um, you kind of get like a sense of what they look like. Um, so we're going to go ahead and talk about just a little bit about what they are and how they kind of fit into this bird world. We'll talk a little bit more about their history uh, in Nebraska and with the prairie. And then we're going to also talk a little bit about their conservation, some challenges and some success stories that we've had with them. All right, so what is a prairie chicken? It's a bird, hopefully everyone got that far, um, but it is a bird. So they are actually game birds in Nebraska, not everywhere. Um, so game just simply meaning that they have a season for them. Um, they are very cool and kind of like quintessential prairie uh, animal when we talk about them, but they are still considered a game species in Nebraska. Um, so they're in the same order um, and family as a lot of the grouse um, and get their name prairie chicken. Um, they look like a chicken. So they're very far off from like a raptor or bird of prey or a um, songbird or anything like that, but they are in that grouse family. So there is the prairie grouse, there's the greater prairie chicken. Um, those kind of animals are still very similar to each other. They share a lot of those attributes and those characteristics with each other. Um, but these guys are special because they are endemic or they're only found in the grasslands of North America. So no other place in the world has these super cool prairie chickens. Um, and when I say that, they kind of range uh, a lot in Nebraska. Um, so everywhere from like central Canada all the way down to Texas. So if you imagine that Great Plains swath in the middle, um, almost like the central flyway for those of you that are bird people, um, that's kind of where they are in. A little past that and a little wider berth, but they are in that main um area as well. So the greater prairie chicken, um, originally it was included uh, the lesser prairie chicken as well, um, but people have distinctively said that they're two different things. Um, so it was given its own like special species label um, back in 1880. Five. So, um, so there are greater prairie chickens, there's lesser prairie chickens, and then there's something else that we'll get to here in a second. Um, but if you look at a greater versus a lesser prairie chicken, graters are simply going to be a little bit larger, hence the name greater, and a little bit darker in their colors. And then the males, it's kind of hard to see here, but I'll show you a better picture in a minute. They have these really cool orange air sacs that they will use to inflate and deflate for um, breeding purposes. So 
Um, a lot of people, there's a huge debate about whether prairie chicken, lesser prairie chicken should be the same. Should they be different? Um, it's like a lot of the subspecies uh, stuff that people wonder about. There's just a lot of debates that kind of follows that. But we are going to consider for today the greater prairie chicken as its own uh, individual animal. All right, so just a little bit about the biology of prairie chickens. Um, there are three distinct subspecies. So there's something there was, I guess I should say, was um, the heath hen. Um, it once inhabited like basically the U.S. Um, in the eastern portion, but we believe that it has been extinct for over 80 years now. No one has seen one. Um, maybe they're still out there and just hiding, but uh, we haven't seen any. So that was one subspecies. And there's another called the Atwaters prairie chicken. This one's still alive today, um, but it's only found in that coastal part of Texas, so all the way down south. And then there's also what we call now the interior greater prairie chicken. So um, this is the most widespread of those three species when they were alive. Um, and so these guys are unique to that grassland. So like I mentioned, they are endemic to that area. Uh, there also have been several hybrid species reported. Um, so it does happen. Um, even in Nebraska, I found a paper that said about 0.3 to about 1.2% of all the prairie chickens, they have a, some type of hybridization in Nebraska. So it's not a very big number, that 1.2%, um, but just letting everyone know, I thought it was kind of interesting, so. Hey, right. Monica. Yeah. Hey, sorry. We do have a good question asking, is the prairie chicken able to fly? They are. They are not super graceful. Um, they're kind of like a turkey. They're just a little bit heavier than most like uh, perching birds or stuff like that, but they do fly. They actually roost up in trees. Um, and we will talk about that in a little bit later. And I see Bill asked about what the size of their clutches. Yes, we will get to that a little bit in when we talk about um, the uh, reproduction of them. Yeah, awesome, thank you. All right, so like I mentioned, these guys are very unique. If you look at this bird, it, it looks very different than any other uh, bird that you normally see. Those grouse species kind of have those same types of characteristics. Um, but today we're gonna be focused on that greater prairie chicken. So they were once very abundant in this new world, um, but they were widely hunted for food and also for sport. Um, in 1853, there were these huge shipments of on the rail cars um, to like city markets and things like that 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 included prairie chickens by the tons. So they were once hunted um, a great deal, like many other species that have come to be here in this world. Um, they were hunted quite frequently. And then once people realized uh, almost before it was too late, uh, maybe we need to put some regulations on this, then um, that kind of happened. That model of North American model of conservation comes into play. Um, and people kind of realize that we, we have to put some regulations on them or we won't have them anymore. Um, so the range of this bird has also shifted because of human development and urban sprawl. Um, so the range of this bird um, basically is their range is simply because of human pattern. So how we have come and um, you know changed their landscape and move things to converted uh, prairies to agricultural lands, that their influence has been because of us. So um, it's not necessarily always a bad thing. They do use croplands as part of their habitat, um, but it's just that amount of space that's less for them now. All right, so their historic range, um, originally from when they were first here, they liked moister, tall grass prairies and that oak savannas. Um, oak woodlands were also very important for them because they provided that winter food source. There's not a lot of food on the prairie um, in the winter time. Uh, and then this is basically what they have left. So, um, but as time has shifted and the conversion of prairie to agricultural lands has also changed, um, their range has also changed. So prairies were converted to agricultural lands. They've now spread into places like southern Canada, into the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas. There's even small isolated populations in places like Wyoming and Colorado. Um, but in the 1930s, agriculture started to heavily intensify, and those are when the birds started rapidly declining. So there was this huge spurt, oh, we should probably take care of them. And then the 1930s, it was a huge downplay again. Um, but uh, they're actually doing quite well in Nebraska. Uh, so today there's populations that are relatively secure are in places Nebraska, South Dakota, and Eastern Kansas. Uh, Nebraska is one of those places that we're very fortunate to have quite a few of them. Uh, there was a 
uh, project, I think by US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Missouri Department of Conservation a few years ago, um, where they actually came to Nebraska and took some of our prey chickens, like it was okay, they had permits and everything, they took some of our prey chickens, and they wanted to rebuild their population in Missouri. So it's kind of neat that Nebraska had those birds that were available. Um, we did the same thing with our river otters. So river otters were once extirpated from the state of Nebraska and we borrowed river otters um, from other states and did the same thing. So it's something that happens quite frequently in the conservation world. We're, we're all here to help each other and our main goal is to help those species. Um, so it happens quite frequently. Uh, there's also those small, really remnant populations, though, in those other states that I mentioned, like Wyoming and Colorado. Um, these really are isolated and uh, very vulnerable to extirpation, though. So they're so small, they don't have a lot of genetic diversity, so they're very vulnerable, um, but they're still considered populations. Uh, so the greater prairie chickens also, they're very sensitive to habitat fragmentation, so the breaking apart of their habitats, and then their breeding populations, um, it's really important for them to have at least 185 acres. So thinking about a state like Nebraska that is 97% privately owned land, that's hard to find. So um, we really rely on those private landowners and even public lands to have those spaces for prairie chickens to breed. And then also they have those major influencing factors that, you know, like urban development and the increasing amount of agricultural conversion also limits their habitat as well. All right, so that was just like a quick introduction about prairie chickens. Um, We'll check the chat really quick. Um, we do right. have a few questions here. Uh, the first one up here is, uh, have they been domesticated or can they be? So maybe, I'm not sure about, I know like obviously pheasants are. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if they truly have been domesticated. Obviously like this other species of grouse have been, but I'm not exactly sure about prairie chickens. Uh, someone asked what they eat. Uh, we will get to that. Um, do they blend in with their habitat? Yeah, good question. Uh, when you look at them, you would think that they wouldn't because of those orange sacks, um, but their striped patterns really help blend in with those grasses. And I'll show you some more pictures where you can uh, really see that as well. Um, how far east have they been spotted? Ooh, good question. Uh, I was just going to get into that. Um, there's actually small little populations in southeast Nebraska. Um, I thought they were just in the sand hills, but um, all the way to like the Kansas border and then extreme like southeast Nebraska. I know like Johnson County, they've been found as well. Um, someone asked, was the Missouri work successful? You know what, the last year that I participated um, was the last year that I kind of knew anything about it. I'm hoping it is successful, but I did not follow up on that project. It's not really my, my realm, um, but I would hope that it is. Uh, someone asked how big they are, um, about the size of a football. It's a little bit bigger than a football, if you can imagine that. Someone asked, why are they so allowed to be hunted if there aren't that many left? Um, so we'll get into that a little bit in our conservation section. Um, hunting could actually be a good benefactor for them. Um, it raises awareness for the birds. It brings in money for the birds and for habitats. And leaving it to our biologists, if they truly did not think that we had enough, they would not allow that. Um, so I'm going to trust our biologists because that's, that's why we hired them. So um okay so we'll kind of get to the rest of this i see some questions we'll we will definitely still get there so thank you i'm so glad everyone's excited about prairie chickens all right so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about their biology and kind of their life history so this is what they look like so um their scientific name is i'm not going to pronounce it because i'm not going to do a very good job but it's that um so when you break that down that latin name um it actually refers to the tympanum um so your tympanum is like your eardrum so if you imagine those cool little feathers that stick up that's called their pinnae that's how they get their name um and so that's also that tympanum refers to that booming sound that they make when they um, do their courtship displays, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And then also the word cupido refers to their cupid wing. So also their um, cute little pinnae that they have as well. So, um, and then also um, males will raise and lower those during courtship. So usually when they're booming and dancing on the ground is when they have them up, but they can actually lower them as well. So they're a medium-sized grouse. Their color is mostly that olive brown. They have those white crossbars on their um, 
on their face and on their ground. Um, and then they're also pretty, tail is short and kind of rounded at the end. Um, males and females look a little bit different. Males are gonna have these really bright colored air sacs. Um, like right here, the female does not. Um, they just simply don't need them. Um, they're the ones being courted. They don't have to court anybody. And then also the females are gonna have shorter pinna feathers. So those ones that stick up. Um, so that's kind of how you tell the difference between a male and a female. All right, so their distribution, like I mentioned, they're endemic to the grasslands. So nowhere else in the world can you find prairie chickens except for here in our grasslands. Uh, Nebraska is one of those states that has a very extensive range. So all the way from southeastern Nebraska to the sand hills and kind of everywhere in between. Um, and then also we have quite a few abundance of prairie chickens. Um, there's a lot of people that go view them in blinds, um, which is becoming a very increasing amount of ecotourism, almost like the cranes. Not not on the same scale, but same purpose. Um, and that is also helping their uh, conservation, their money coming in, and then people just raising awareness, knowing that they're here. And then also uh, population estimates. How do we know how many we have? Well, we base those on the very scientific way of counting. So someone will sit out there and kind of count um, during the courtship displays on um, the LEX is what we call them, those display grounds, um, and then also harvest data. So any of them that come in, um, we use that data to kind of estimate how many we have. We're never going to get an exact number because no one's going to be out there counting every single prairie chicken, um, but it is um, a pretty good estimate on how many we have. But we are also seeing those trends from harvest data and looking at the display grounds. Um, they're showing the long-term population trends. It might be one year after another, but once you get so many years of data, you have a huge amount of a trend that you can look at. Um, overall, we have seen that they have been declining. But in Nebraska, they've pretty much remained stable. We're one of the few states where they have not rapidly declined. All right, so historically, prairie chickens, um, we're going to go back to like Lewis and Clark. They saw them on the Missouri, which is weird because I always thought they were a sandhills grassland species. Now they're pretty much restricted restricted to the sandhills, but uh, someone asked earlier how far east. There's extreme southeast Nebraska and also down south, uh, really close to the border of Kansas, they have been seen as well. Uh, and then there's two large, like continuous distributions in Nebraska. One of those goes from South Dakota into Nebraska, and then also one in Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. So Nebraska is in both of those two distributions. So our populations are doing fairly well. Um, there's really little historical evidence about them elsewhere in the state, um, but maybe at one time they inhabited the, inhabited the entire state. Um, but this is kind of our historical records and what we have now. All right, so what are they doing throughout the year? So we know that um, if you're into prairie chickens and you know about them, they're booming in their display grounds. That happens in the spring, but what do they do during the rest of the seasons? Um, so these birds are mostly diurnal, so that means they're out during the daytime. Uh, they like to feed during the morning and the evening hours, and then pretty much they sleep all day. So they sleep and they roost at night, mostly in trees. So someone asked me if they're good flyers. Well, they can fly, doesn't mean they're great at it, but they are birds and they have wings. So yes, they can fly. Um, and then also during the spring courtship, uh, that's when you're most likely to see the males and the fem females visit those leks or those booming grounds. It's really also difficult to get the information on some of those because they flush very easily compared to other species. Um, they're very sensitive to changes and sounds and they don't like them. So uh, when people are in a blind, you don't move until they're gone. So you might be peeing in a bucket for a while. Um, you might be out there an hour, you might be out there for six hours. So you, even the shutting of the door um, or movement in the blind can scare them and flush them. And then that affects their breeding and their courtship. So something we don't wanna do, but it's also hard to get that data because they flush easier than other species. And then also their winter season flocks. Um, this is when they become established and they get fairly large, 100 to 200 flocks in the winter time. But often early in the winter, once they kind of establish who, who's here, they will break off into smaller groups for the winter time, just because it's easier to get food and find a roosting ground. 
All right, and then springtime, most of their activity is focused on lek sites. So males are trying to find them, they're establishing their territory, and females are going to usually come later on. Um, males will come first. Females are going to usually stay around where they're going to eventually nest, uh, which makes sense. They don't want to go too far, um, but they remain relatively um, still for the, at least the four weeks after snow melt. So after that snow melts, they will start to boom and start to be on those leks or those display grounds. And then also in the summer, they will forage a ton, mostly in the cooler part of the day because it's hot and they don't want to be out there. And then they will rest most of the day in the shade. And then at times in extreme heat, they will often take dust baths. So they'll roll in the dust or that sandy soil um, to get the bugs off of them or to even cool down. A lot of animals will do that as well. All right, in the fall then, the prairie chicken broods, um, so all their young will commence in the late summer. Um, most common though, it's in the fall. Uh, individuals will also uh, leave at different times. So females will lay different clutches throughout the year. Um, so the older ones will kind of take off, but the female might still have younger ones that will stay and then they will leave at different times. Uh, the juveniles have huge mobility compared to the adults. So they're gonna go establish themselves and not worry about the adults they are gonna move a little little bit more than adults who already have established territories. Um, basically, they're looking for flocks to join at this time. And then also the flock size um, will increase as that autumn goes on. And then early, once that winter comes, they have those 100, 200 um, birds in that flock. And then later on, they'll disperse into those smaller groups. All right. Um, they spend most of the time in the ground, on the ground, um, but they will fly when they're disturbed. So again, the flushing, they will flush very easily. Um, historical evidence suggests that they were very migratory, um, basically between their breeding and their wintering grounds, but maybe not so much anymore. Um, there are places like in Minnesota where they have huge scale movements, um, pretty long distances between their breeding sites and then their wintering areas. And then even in Colorado, there have been uh, reports about about females um, migrating later than in uh, than males in the spring. So males will go find that established territory and then females will come in later, but like a lot later. So again, it just depends on the state. It depends on the climate. Um, but in Nebraska, we believe that they don't really move a lot between breeding and wintering grounds, at least not as far as places like Minnesota or Colorado. All right, so what's their habitat look like? Well, they like grasslands, um, but they live in areas with few trees and they do actually like some cropland interspersed. Um, but mostly now you find them in mixed grass and tall grass prairies and the sand hills. Um, they need those patches of dense brush because it provides protection for their babies, for themselves, um, from predators, from the elements, but then also they need an open area for their chicks. So they like a lot of different types of habitats. Um, that's why most of the time you see them either in Southeast Nebraska or the sand hills, um, that kind of transition zone between the short grass, mixed grass, uh, prairie, and that's where you're gonna find them. Also, they need open areas for chicks. Some of you might be like, well, aren't those easier for predators to take? They eat a lot of insects and the area that's open is going to have the most insects for those chicks to eat. All right, so what do they eat? They eat pretty much anything. They eat leaves, they eat fruits, acorns, corn, sunflower seeds and grains, uh, grasshoppers, crickets, beetles, uh, pretty much anything they can eat. Uh, they mostly forage on the ground, but they are able to climb up into trees or fly into trees, I guess, um, and eat the buds and also the leaves. And then especially when the snow uh, limits access to food on the ground, uh, they will fly up into the trees and eat. And then the chicks are mostly gonna eat those insects. So these are um, lots of different types of habitats where they need to forage. All right, that was a little bit about them. And I am not gonna cover everything just because we only have so much time, um, but uh, we'll go ahead and check the chat here. Um, let's see, someone asked how big they get. Are, the, are they prey to bigger animals? Yes. Um, things like hawks, um, goss hawks will eat them, virginous hawks, eagles will eat them, golden eagles will eat them, even things like a coyote or uh, maybe like a really um, pretentious raccoon could get the chicks also as well. Um, do house cats affect populations? You know, I would assume yes, house cats affect everything. Um, so I'm sure in some way in the food web or food chain that they do, but I didn't see any data when I looked at how they directly affect them. Good question. 
Um, do they go south like other birds? We kind of answered that. Um, we'll talk about their eggs. Uh, what animal eats them? I mentioned that earlier. Someone, so they're generally opportunistic feeders. Yeah, pretty much. They will eat uh, whatever they can find during the season that they can find it in. All right, great. All right, so this is a huge portion of the, the program today just simply because this is what they do. And this is a really cool thing that I wanna talk about. So their courtship and that we call their booming. So basically their breeding behavior. So um, one of the several species um, of birds in the world that has what we call a lek mating system. So the lek simply just refers to the grounds that they have their um, booming or their courtship display on. Um, so what does this mean? So the males will not provide any parental care. That just is how their, you know, organization works here. Um, females will come into an area um, basically, or that lek mating system. This is where they are looking for a male. And then the display sites that are used by the males they don't contain any specific resources for females other than the males themselves. So once they mate, they go off their separate ways and the females have to find their nest site. They have to find food for their babies. They have to make their own nest. They have to um, care for their young and incubate those eggs. So um, males, they come and they mate and then they leave. And then a female can choose a mate once she visits the lek and sees something that she likes. Um, there are times where a female will come, uh, they, these guys might boom or display for weeks or sometimes months at a time. And when the female doesn't see something she likes, she'll come back the next day. If she doesn't see something she likes, she'll come back at the next day. So they are literally doing everything to attract those females. Uh, lecking species also have these elaborate courtship displays because they have this huge arena. Um, so this is what they're doing. So we'll talk a little bit about like what exactly they're doing as far as their cool breeding displays. All right, so what do they do? So in the springtime, we refer to it as booming. So all of these things they will do um, simultaneously, probably at the same time. So think about the males will extend their eye combs. So those little like orange eyebrow looking things, they will lower their heads. They'll put up their little um, head feathers. They'll point their tail forward. They'll stamp on the ground. They'll click their tail. So it looks like a little machine working. It's kind of neat. Um, they'll shake. Sometimes they'll drop their wings um, to touch the ground so they'll expand their air sacs and then of course they make this really cool booming sound um, if you've ever blown uh, air over the top of an empty bottle that's the best way that I can kind of describe how it sounds I'm not going to do it but if you have an empty bottle and you blow air across of it that's what that male prairie chicken sounds like which is really neat all right um so uh, also the amount of things and the timing that they do this, um, they'll do it more when there's more females there. That makes sense. They want to impress the females. So the more females that are there, the more they're going to really show off. And then the peak time that they do this in Nebraska is between April and mid-May. Given the weather and things like that, I've seen it in March before. It just, again, depends on the snow melt and it depends on the, the climate and the day that it's given. All right, so looking at their vocalization, it's very low frequency. Um, so when you're watching them and you're hearing all of them go at once, it almost gives you a headache just because it's so low in frequency, but it's such a cool sound. If you get a chance to go, I would highly recommend going to watch this. Um, so in addition to that booming sound that males will do, they will also what we call flutter jump. So they leap in the air, they flap their wings, and then they like whoop or cackle um, or make these little calls. And then uh, the display, like I said, it really runs from March to June, but their peak time is April to May. Again, just kind of depends on the time. Um, but the uh, reason that they do this again is all for that female. If she doesn't see something she likes, they're like, well, I guess we'll just try it next time. So um, the female is the one that makes all the calls. All right, so males will also establish territories right away on those leks. Um, the sites usually are those top males or the ones that are older, they have more experience, they should get more girls. Um, so basically there's two different areas. There's something called a core area of the lek. Um, so neighboring males here are really seldom encountered. That's their spot and they've claimed that area. 
once you get out of the core area, which is, you know, the main arena, it's the main focus that females are going to look at the younger kind of more inexperienced males are going to be on the outside. They're going to start running into each other because there's only so much great territory left. Um, this is where sometimes you will see like those aggressive encounters. Um, so they have talons like spurs on a pheasant. If you've ever seen, um, like little toenails that stick out on the back, they will scratch, they will jump in the air and claw at each other. Um, they'll make noises. So it's, again, it's like literally fighting to have their genes passed on. So um, they're going to um, have a lot of aggressive encounters with each other. But one of the things that is very uh, almost hurtful for their populations is that there's a dominant couple of males in that lek. They will mate with about 90% of those females. Um, that's a huge portion. Um, if you think about it, there's not a lot of genetic diversity. So in places like Nebraska, we're a little bit more lucky because we don't have those isolated populations. But in places like Colorado or Wyoming, if you get a small little population and a couple males mate with all the females, you're going to only carry on those genes. And if those genes are the only ones you carry on, you're not going to have a lot of diversity. Um, and that's going to hurt your population later on. Um, a great example is this of, uh, we don't have in Nebraska, but cheetahs, we call this a bottleneck. Um, so basically you get so low on your genes that this is what you got and this is all that happens. And then you start to have issues, um, things like inbreeding and um, other like genetic makeups. So it's not always great, but this is what they do. 90% of males will mate with the females. All right, so what do the females look like? Here's a female. So again, not very flashy at all, but she doesn't need to be. Um, the peak of female attendance is based on the peak male time. So the more males that are out and calling, the more females that are gonna be there. Um, and also they will visit in small flocks. So maybe two or three or four uh, females will go at a time. And then again, they have a social hierarchy too. <clears throat> There's a dominant female. Um, basically once she has mated or left the lek, the other subordinate ones can come in and choose. But again, they kind of get what's left. Um, but females also tend to walk through the center of the lek before they even mate with those dominant females and defend their position there. Um, so again, they're doing this all for the females and she gets to walk through and decide yes or no or no thank you or swipe right or whatever you have to do. Um, and then also females um, will visit maybe more than one lek if they do not see what they like at a certain one. Um, so they have that opportunity to go from lek to lek. Males usually establish a territory and stay there. All right, so their nests. So females, once they mate um, and they copulate, they will have eggs. So females will construct nests that are actually just little shallow shaped depressions on the ground. Um, and then after they uh, will initiate egg laying, um, one to five days after they copulate, it just depends. Um, but they will sometimes, they will skip steps. So they might lay one egg and then two, three days later, they lay another egg. Two, three days later, they may lay another egg. Um, and then usually those eggs are incubated for about 23 to 25 days. So when they construct this nest, they will go find their um, space that they want to have, and then they will line it with things like grass sleeves and feathers to make it soft. And then females also, once they have those eggs, they may lay another clutch um, or even a third clutch. It just depends if they're predated on. Um, sometimes they will abandon the nest. Um, sometimes the nest will get destroyed. Um, so they are able to lay a few clutches um, interspersed throughout the season. All right, so little chicks are cute. Um, so the amount of chicks is larger in the first clutch than it will ever be in that second or third. So that's kind of one her one shot. But if they do not last or if they get predated on, she at least has a second or possibly a third clutch as well. Um, parental care is all females. Males play no role in this at all, except for the copulating part. Um, and then the females will travel through vegetated areas with their chicks. Um, the broods are actually pretty mobile. Um, they need to move a lot just because um, they're constantly looking for food. They're on the move to not get predated on. Um, but one thing is like the brood breakup. So once they are laid, they may hatch two, three days later, you might have another brother or sister. Um, it's really poorly understood why and how they do that. Um, so just that um, brood breakup. And then in the first 28 hours or so, they may move on average about 1.4 kilometers. And then by the end of the first week, they've averaged about 3.8 kilometers. So for a little chick and a pheasant, or sorry, a little chick and a prey chicken, that is quite far for them to move. So highly mobile um, after they are born. 
All right, so that was kind of like their biology and like the care of their young and their bird ship and courting displays. Um, if you get a chance after this, um, and I can link some really good videos in our uh, registration email as well um, about them booming and actually seeing this happen. So uh, the lecking grounds are so cool. And like I mentioned, if you get a chance to go, please take that. So um, do males fight each other? Yes. How big do their eggs get? Um, not very big. Like if you think of like a chicken egg, um, that's about the same size. Um, are there any lex on WMAs or state parks in the state? And are they listed on maps and brochures? Um, so yes, um, someone, uh, we have a watchable wildlife person. Um, her name is Olivia Durunga out in, um, Scott's Bluff area, she has all that information. And I can link her name into the chat as well, or into the registration email as well. Um, there are a couple of great outfitters um, in the Sand Hills that take people out to the blinds to view prairie chickens. Um, but I will warn you, they get filled up very quickly. So if that's something you're interested in, Google search um, prairie chicken outfitters in Nebraska or prairie chicken viewing in Nebraska. Um, and there's always something you could probably find. Um, Burchard is a good spot. Um, yes, uh, one of the things about the private or public lands is that we only have so many. A lot of this viewing is on private land. And so they have again in, made like a blind or a area to view them in. Um, and that's where that outfitting comes in. So again, we rely heavily on our private landowners just simply because 97% of our land is privately owned. So um, someone asked what color their eggs are. I'm not sure. I don't want to mention that, but I could look um, into that as well. Someone asked what's done being done to increase our population. We will talk about that next. Um, if a female leaves a nest, will another female take it? Ooh, I did not find any information saying anything about that. Um, I, I don't know. That's a good question. How old do they get? Um, or can, or can they get? I'm guessing not very old, uh, just simply because of predation. Um, and like most chickens, they don't last very long either. Uh, so maybe like three to five years, that might be a stretch, but I don't, that's what I'm gonna guess. Can they, or do they coexist with prairie dogs? Yes, yeah, so the lecking grounds, um, the one time that I went, there was a multitude of species there. Um, so you would hear prairie chickens, but then you would see like a golden eagle. We saw burrowing owls, we saw prairie dogs. So yes, it is not unusual to see um, other species with these guys. They've co and coexisted with them for how many, uh, you know, hundreds of years and they're still doing it. So it is not unusual to see different species um, at those lecking grounds as well. All right, we'll go ahead and keep moving here just because we are at 340. Um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about, sorry, this spelled wrong, conservation and concerns here. Um, so their primary threats, when we look at them, um, primary threat usually of any animal is habitat loss, degradation, um, fragmentation. It's that habitat perspective. Um, so they do inhibit, like we talked about, public and private land. So for public and private lands to work together, there's a number of things that we need to consider. So these would be things um, in areas, there's like tier one, tier two. These are areas that are, we have prey chickens, they're doing okay, but we also need to remember to do these things. So just the timing and the intensity of your livestock grazing, um, converting those native prairies um, for development and crop production, increasing the number of people on the earth, they need more food. So the idea is to take um, unused areas, I guess is what some people call them and make them into crop fields. But again, that makes that monoculture, you don't get that diversity. Um, so again, you lose species by actually doing that. So keeping those native prairies, um, the construction of roads, um, thinking about where you put them, the fences, the wind turbines, there's been a ton of studies that UNL has done about the effects of wind turbines and prairie chicken grounds, because they literally sometimes put them right in the area of their lecking ground and how that affects them. Um, and then and also thinking about expansion and introduction of things like noxious weeds, the alteration of our fire regimes, and then even planting of trees. Um, planting of trees is not always the best bet. Places like this, they don't want trees. Um, so planting trees in the correct areas as well. 
All right, so something else that's also a concern is like their genetic makeup. So we talked earlier, we in Nebraska, we don't have a huge problem with this, but it could become a problem. So small and isolated populations, they lose genetic diversity over time. It's just gonna happen. And then also populations that are becoming isolated or reduced, um, basically their genetic diversity is just rapidly declining. Like we just don't have um, enough prairie chickens and enough genes to make up for what we're losing. Um, it also increases that probability of like extinction and then also decreases their future adaptation. So if we have less genes, they're less likely to be able to develop in the future or change with the future landscapes. And then also you have things like it affects inbreeding and then that random loss of alleles. So you're just not gonna have those mutations um, or those um, that long-term existence. You're just not gonna have it anymore. All right, so what are some extrinsic things that we have to think about? Um, things that we cannot change. Weather, predation, habitat, disease. Um, habitat, in a way we can, um, it provides cover and protects from predators, but the amount of it is decreasing. Um, it can also affect uh, insects for chicks as well. Um, we talked about chicks are highly susceptible to what we call chilling. Um, so conditions are basically they get too cold, too cold and too wet. Um, and something we, we really can't help that. Sometimes there's bad years, sometimes there's good years. Um, predation can also have that significant mortality for nesting females. She would rather die and get eaten than leave her eggs. Um, so that's something that we have to consider too. And then also probably parasites. Um, where there hasn't been any uh, studies that I saw for Nebraska specific ones, but we know that there's parasites that affect other animals and different grouse species. So are those going to move into prairie chickens? Is that something that um, we have to start thinking about, especially with that loss of genetic makeup as well? All right, so what are we doing to conserve these species? We have to have better land management practices. So um, huge thing is keeping and not fragmenting or destroying their habitat. So less conversion of native prairies, keeping our native prairies, keeping those native um, grasses and plants there. Um, that's why when everyone says, you know, what can I do to help? Um, keep native prairies, um, plant native an uh, grasses, and that will bring those native animals back. Um, recommendations for harvest. Um, our um, biologists here at Game of Parks, they do look at this every single year. So if they say that we're not getting, uh, we don't have the numbers of prairie chickens to harvest, they might scale that back. Um, if they think that we have a lot this year, let's go ahead and do that, then they will upscale it. But also looking at the rate and the production, um, how is our long-term population trends doing? Um, and again, it's all just dependent on that. And then consideration of obstacles, um, like should you really put a fence there? How are power lines gonna help with this? Um, there are towers and guide wires as well. Um, we're moving a lot more to like energy efficiency. So things like wind power, um, but that also affects their habitat and their fragmentation. So thinking about those as well. And then development of research um, and adaptive management approaches. So we really just need more research. And this is why we need more biologists to figure out um, how we're gonna do this and how we're gonna conserve this species. All right, and then again, um, really looking at um, the construction of within so many LECs. So um, looking at this, like they do need croplands, um, but again, prohibiting that disturbance. So this is for, um, I talked earlier about that tier one and tier two. This is like what immediate things that we can do because this is an area that's in trouble. So basically prohibiting um, any construction within so many miles of a lek or a display ground, um, prohibiting that disturbance. So things like gravel mining, drilling of water wells, um, even hunting dog trainings, they can't do that within a certain kilometers of this um, lecking space. And then manage viewing activities. So yes, we want people to go out there and spend money and do ecotourism, but also understanding that it's still a disturbance for those animals. Even if you're quiet and they don't know you're there, it's something different. Uh, we also need to design and implement livestock grazing strategies um, for that quality nesting and brooding habitat. Again, don't plant trees, um, plant trees in correct areas, not in the prairie. And then prescribed burning. A lot of people see this as a negative thing. Wildfires aren't necessarily the greatest, but prescribed controlled burning is something that the prairie's been doing it for years and um, a long time, and it continues to need that burn off of things. So that's something that will help with it as well. 
All right. Um, someone asked earlier about hunting uh, and how this actually may positively affect them. So it creates incentives for habitat preservations. All of the um, landowners that will get certain compensations if people can view wildlife or hunt on their property. Um, and then also the blind viewing of Lex and the booming. Many states have established as public viewing blinds. Nebraska is one of them. Also looking at community science programs and those watchful wildlife programs as well. And then something else is just that population monitoring and that habitat monitoring as well is something that's going to take a long time. And we've been doing it for a long time, but we just need more of it. All right, I think that was it. Yes, so that was it for um, prairie chickens today. Um, but we have next week, we're going to switch to fish. Um, so we're going to be talking about not the walleye, not the bluegills, the little tiny minnows and the dace and the darters that we're going to talk about next week. Um, and then we have three, two more after that. So damselflies and dragonflies. And then we're going to finish off the winter series with ungulate. So um, don't know what an ungulate is. That's okay. Uh, we will talk about that. All right, if you liked this and you want more, I mentioned earlier, a lot of those evaluations, people put like, I wanna see stuff on raptors or owls or fungi. You might already have, you might already have done a science of um, that talks about that. So visit our education YouTube channel, which I'll put a link to in your email. And you might be able to watch a science of fungi, a science of raptor. So we've done a ton of them and they might already be out there if you're looking for them. We also have a Facebook page and Instagram page. This will tell you 99.999% of everything that's going on within our divisions and events that are coming up um, and cool things that we have. And then also just our Nebraska Wildlife Education website. We have some other links to virtual programs that we've done. We have some downloadable activities on there as well. And then just simply more information about wildlife in Nebraska. Nebraska. All right. So thanks, everyone. Um, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And then I see there's like quite a few things in the chat. All right. Um, oh, gosh, how far do I have to go? Um, okay. Probably more of a general question. Um, why are bird eggs different colors? Uh, it all just depends on the makeup of the bird and makeup of the species, um, the calcium levels that they have, um, the uh, pigments that they have in their body and their skin. That's a good question. There's lots of different factors for that. Um, someone asked about um, yeah, someone said Calamus Outfitters near Burwell um, is a great place to do prey chicken tours. Will they hurt people um, if you get in their booming grounds? Um, they're going to flush right away, um, but I would never suspect that they would hurt somebody. Uh, again, only about the size of a football. So maybe if they ran into you, like they flew into your face, maybe. Um, but yeah, good question. Um, do they compete for ground with pheasants? Um, possibly, um, possibly, uh, pheasants are one of those species that are not native to Nebraska. They are an introduced species, not invasive, but introduced. Um, so I would like to say that pheasants are competing for ground. Um, prairie chickens should be there. Pheasants, maybe not. Okay. Um, can individuals be introduced into small groups to promote genetic diversity? Uh, good question. I think that is the study that Missouri tried to do. Um, so yes, that might be something that we really need to focus on or places like Wyoming or Colorado are focusing on because they have those small isolated populations. If you start introducing, hopefully that would help. Um, but again, just because you introduce something doesn't mean it's going to fit right away. So it, it might take years of that, but yes, that is something that could possibly happen. Um, how much energy do they have? I'm not sure if I understand that question by energy, if you could maybe explain that a little bit more. Um, are they susceptible to the avian flu like chickens? Good question, Mary. I would like to say that any um, uh, avian animal or any bird would be. I know like pelicans have gotten it. Um, if you have been watching the news, the uh, Riverside Zoo in, South, in Scotts Bluff actually had two big cats that I think died because of that, because they ate geese that were infected with it. So I want to say that, yes, they could possibly be, um, it, that could possibly be, I want to say also it's more when they gather together. Um, and so the warmer it gets, usually they start to disperse. Um, uh, but good question. I don't know if there's any data on that yet. Um, 
how many wildfires can burns do in a year? So usually what they do for prescribed burning is they will find a section and they will burn sections at a time. Um, very rarely would they ever um, burn a place year after year after year because nothing's going to survive. Um, it would just be for certain times and then they would rotate their prescribed burning. Uh, what animals can they live with? Anything else that's on the prairie, um, things like different types of birds, like burrowing owls, prairie dogs, um, even though they would be a predator, different animals like eagles or goshawks as well. Um, are there nature cameras to watch the booming live? I don't know. That would just be like a Google search. I know they have eagle cams and watering hole cams, um, but that would, um, that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah. Good. I hope everyone had good information. Um, I hope you got some more. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's it. So again, I will send everyone an email um, that registered for this with some cool um, resources as well as um, the recording to this too. So um, I'll probably give me like uh, 24 hours to get that up and then we will be able to send that all to you tomorrow. So thanks everyone. I hope that you learned some stuff and um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me and I will get those questions answered to you. So otherwise we'll see you next week for um, darters and minnows. We'll talk about fish. So thank you everyone. We'll see you. Thank you, Paige.